Everybody, welcome back. Hope you're having a good week so far. This is Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. And to bring you on that journey through the show is Mo Moten. He's a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report, also Raiders columns at sportsnot.com. You can follow him if you dare on x.com at Mo Moten, M O E M O T O N. I am Scott Cabranson, the other host here. You can follow me on x.com at LV Gully, and the show is SNB Today. Do us a favor, wherever you subscribe to your audio, please subscribe to the show. The way Apple has changed its system with Apple Podcasts, if you haven't listened in a while, because some people kind of check out a little bit during the offseason, guess what? Go back and subscribe again. It's not going to download for you. You got to go back, subscribe again, make sure you turn that on so that the newest uh, episode is delivered to you whenever we have a new one. All right, so lots to talk about today. We're also going to, it's the off season, you know, and Mo and I have been so impressed, and Mo, back me up on this. We've been so impressed with the calls that have been coming in from Raider Nation that we're doing another mailbag today. We're going to do some calls today. If you haven't called in yet, it's okay. We're going to do more on Thursday as well, 702 900 7869. That's 702 900 7869. It's in the description on YouTube. If you're watching us or if you're listening to the podcast here on this Tuesday, you can see it below as well in the description. The number, if you forget it, don't worry about it. 702 900 7869. Leave us a message for Thursday's show and we'll get you on the air. Mo, okay, rookie minicamp. We saw uh, some football, well, if you want to call it that, shorts and helmets and shirts and guys <laughs> racing around having some press conferences but rookie minicamp in Henderson and a lot to like here especially from the feel goods right I mean Jackson Powers Johnson goes out and talks about how much the shield means here's a guy who understands the Raider mystique he's from Utah yes but grandparents were season ticket holders all that jazz uh, and so N Raider Nation already in love with this guy and they should be because if you watch his film I think he's going to be just an absolute bruiser in the NFL. Uh, also, we heard from Brock Bowers. We heard from a lot of the rookies there, including uh, Coach Antonio Pierce. Anything stick out to you? We're not going to get a lot of football stuff out of these. These are just, in essence, hey, come into the office, check it out, do some drills, run around, and get familiar with where you're going to be working. But anything stick out for you, Mo, from the weekend and the rookie minicamp? I think the offensive line group is going to be the most competitive group going into camp, minotaur mini camp, training camp. Um, it's simply because of the names that are involved. And I thought about something over the weekend, and there's some rumblings on the X about where Jackson Bowers Johnson could start, whether it's left or right guard. I think the idea of starting J JPJ at left guard makes sense because you put him next to a veteran in Colton Miller. Mm. And on the right side, maybe you have Parham, assuming that he's still the guy there over Cody White here. Now, Parham is is not a veteran, but he has some experience. And you put him next to Thayer Mumford, who's, again, not a veteran, but has some experience. So technically, I would feel a lot better about the offensive line, if, even though I'm high on JPJ, having a rookie next to a more established veteran like Colton Miller than having him on the right side next to Thayer Mumford, who's trying to get the job he's not solidified yet yeah it's interesting to see how those battles are going to go out and of course we saw uh the, the raiders have cut i mean have made moves right when you look at players they brought in uh and so you look at dylan parham and and to your point about the and cody whitehair and the 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 competition that's going to happen there and i and i wonder because you, you hear some of these our last show i was in the chat on youtube and people were telling me a lot about uh, how the Raiders were going to do this and do that with guys, even though they haven't played in those positions. And what I see, and remember we talked about this, Mo, the fact that on that offensive line, and I agree with you, I think it's going to be incredibly competitive there. 
but what we saw is guys that had a lot of versatility. It wasn't like this guy is a tackle and he's going to be a tackle. Now we know Jackson Powers Johnson is going to be a guard. We know that left, right, we'll see. And I think you make a good point for the left side. Um, but we we also see some of the other uh, uh, s- other signings they made. And a lot of those folks were like telling me like Andres Pete, oh, he'll play on the right side. Well, we heard uh, Antonio Pierce yeah, uh, say, hey, left side, left tackle. He might be depth at left tackle. And I mentioned this last show or two shows ago saying that, you know, Andres Pete, despite the fact that he's played inside, they moved him outside. And I felt like at the time it was a depth signing and sure he'll be there and who knows what happens. But to me with Colton Miller and again, Colton Miller is not an old guy, but from a football year's perspective and from his injury history, the past couple years, a game here and there, you got to have the depth there. So I like not only the competition mode, but the opportunity here that the Raiders are going to have various options and guys who can play inside and outside. Right. And let's remind people that every person that the Raiders sign, every player that the Raiders sign is not necessarily going to have a big role or even make the roster. Mm. So I remember when Andrews Pete was signed, people said, well, he's going to start at this position. He's going to start at that position. I also mentioned, I said, listen, most of his experience is on the left side of the line. Yeah. So he will either – Compete for a position, a starting role at left guard, or he'll be a backup for Colton Miller, um, which is fine because last year Colton Miller missed a chunk of time down the stretch, and you need that backup left tackle who's going to come in, especially if Thayer Mumford is going to start at right tackle. Because remember, Thayer Mumford was the guy who was a swing tackle last year, started both left and right side. Mm -hmm. So if Thayer Mumford has his solidified job on the right side, you're going to need someone to fill backup, fill that role on the left side. And, you know, you have. DJ Glaze, but who knows what position he's going to play. He talked about the versatility. So you want to have a veteran. You want to have veteran insurance there, somebody you can plug and play right away just in case you're in the heat of a playoff race and you need a guy to hold up the fort on the left side of the line. Yeah, and and, and I we had, a, had an interesting interaction with one of our viewers on YouTube about Cody Whitehair because – um, and I, I think it might have been uh, Walt or I can't remember who I should have written down who's, who it was that was was having the discussion with me. But their point was they're like, well, Cody Whitehair is going to be the center. He's going to win out center. And I'm like, they signed Andre James to, to that that contract with guaranteed money. And you don't do that if a guy's going in to compete for his job. In my view, I think Andre James, unless something goes crazy wrong, is the center. So Cody Whitehair compete on the inside there whatever position, or if he doesn't win out, obviously he can be a swing. But I look at that too. And back to the versatility, Andre James signed Andre James. They, the Raiders now have three guys who can legitimately play center, which is a good thing. That goes to the depth piece that on teams like the Raiders, you don't think about it in advance, but man, when there's attrition, if Andre James goes down, God forbid something happens, you have white hair who can do it, which I would assume they would do probably as a second. And then you have, Jackson Powers Johnson, who was the best center in college football. Now they want him to play guard, so they want him to spend the time there, and I think that's where he will. But in a bind, uh, these are the kind of things that I think teams in the past, the Raiders, when they were on the cusp of a 500 or being over 500, they just lacked that depth. When you look at offensive lines across the league, how many teams are blessed enough to have the same offensive line combination from week one to week 18? Right. This doesn't happen. You're going to have injuries. Guys are going to have to, so guys are going to have to move around. So you're not going to have the same five man combination. So you're going to need to practice. And you'll see that during training camp or mandatory mini camp, you'll see guys move around. So I wouldn't fall in love with, oh, JPJ is playing on the right side or he's playing on the left side. Oh, this guy's playing center. He's getting second string snaps at center. They're all going to move around. They're all going to cross train because that's normal for an offensive line group because you're going to deal with injuries during the season and you have to be prepared for that. Yeah, and also coming out of this mini camp, uh, based on reports, to Cameron Richardson uh, again, people uh, were were impressed by him. Look, guys, again, until they get the pads on, it's hard to know. But nationally too, Mo, even your website uh, that you work at at Bleacher Report talked a lot about him being one of the top guys maybe uh, to watch this year. Uh, a guy that many of us felt when he was drafted was like, "Ooh, he might be a project," but he's getting a lot of a pub. Also, Trey Taylor, a guy my, my favorite draft pick of the Raiders in the late rounds, a guy who won, uh, of course, the uh, the best position. He won the the award, the Jim Thorpe Award for the best defensive back in college football. 
He's getting some great pub as well. Ron Stone, the edge rusher, we heard some great things uh, from the media who are watching this as well. So, so it's going to be exciting to watch these guys when they finally get to camp. And and I and I actually posted on X uh, yesterday morning, Mo, as I woke up on a Monday morning sipping my coffee, was, hey, this is a great time of the year to be a fan because everything is positive. Everybody feels good about the Raiders draft for once. I know some of you would have liked a quarterback, but that's the way it goes. But everybody kind of feels good about this. And, and I think that going into camp come July, we're going to have some big question marks. The offensive line, you talked about it. But some of these young players, it's going to be hard to evaluate them until we get a couple weeks into camp. Yeah, I've gone through this, you know, this rodeo for over a decade now. <laughs> Everyone's feeling good about the rookie class. You know, you hear guys at the podium now. Jackson Powers Jackson sounds like he could be a, a future captain, maybe yeah. a captain by year two in this league. He sounds great at the microphone, and that's fine. Brock Bowers as Chip Towers host is not going to wow you with any quotables at the microphone, but it's all business, all football, and that's fine. And and from reports out there, and from practice, Brock, Brock Bowers looks as advertised. His athleticism pops right away, and that's great. But as you said, we won't know how these guys really are going to look on a football field until they put the pads on because that's closer to what an actual football game would be like. You're not running around uh, for 60 minutes in your shorts and T-shirt. So <laughs> while you, it's great to get excited about these mini camp observations that reporters have, let's keep, let's keep everything in perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also, too, things that are said, and we're going to get, we're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back, we'll talk about Antonio Pierce. He spe spoke to the media last week as well, and sort of what he talked about, particularly around the quarterback battle. So we want to talk about that because that's going to be one of the big stories going into training camp as well. So we will get to that here in a second. We're going to take these words uh, to pay some of the bills. When we come back, we'll talk about Aiden O'Connell. We'll talk about of course, Gardner Minshew and, and what uh, Antonio Pierce said about that. And then in the final segment of the show, we will get to some phone calls on the Raider Nation mailbag. So stick where you are. This is Scott. This is Mo. This is Silver and Black today on your Tuesday. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Silver and Black today an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering the Raiders. Do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. And if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that subscription and the notifications bell so that you know every time we have a new video. Mo Moten, Scott Colbranson back with you. And we are talking a rookie minicamp. We're also talking some coaching availability. Antonio Pierce met with the media. And of course, one of the questions was about quarterback and this is one of the big storylines going into camp uh, obviously aiden o'connell who played well last year has an edge he knows the system he's been there and uh he did like i said well in spots last year and antonio pierce in essence and i want to i want to go through this mo because i think people and listen i'm guilty of it too sometimes people hear what they think they hear and what they want to hear and I think what Antonio Pierce said about this quarterback battle was he said, hey, Aiden O'Connell has earned the first opportunity to take the first snap in the first reps. Now, that's true. But remember, that's training camp, folks. He, he didn't say he's starting the first regular season game. He's saying he's going to get the opportunity to go out there first and uh, uh, take some snaps and go. But remember, in training camp, it's not about like it is during the season where the first team gets all the reps and maybe the second team will get a handful or they'll run the scout squad. So when you look at this and what he said about Aiden O'Connell, which I would expect him to say, and Aiden O'Connell deserves it. He came in in a tough situation and uh, did well in spots. And so Aiden O'Connell should be deserved it. I mean, this is what Pierce said, Mo, before I get your reaction. He said, quote, Aiden O'Connell is mentally tough. I said it last year, Aiden has a certain thing mentally where he blocks out the outside noise. Noise. He doesn't worry about it. Um, there's been conversations we've had that I've seen him grow in this short period of time. I'm really excited to see out, uh, Aiden go out there and uh, and in OTAs, mini camp, and training camp. So that's what he said. So when, when people look at this and you see the headlines that say, hey, Pierce says O'Connell gets the first team reps. It's training camp, Mo. So kind of kind of filter through what the coach speak is there. Aiden O'Connell is going to get first team reps in, at camp. 
but it doesn't mean that I still wouldn't say he's the front runner for the job. He is the incumbent because he's been there right before Gardner Minshew. But from from everything that we've been hearing from the Raiders, Tom Telesco, Antonio Pierce, it's going to be an open quarterback competition. So Aiden O'Connell isn't going to be the only person to get first team reps. <laughs> Gardner Minshew is also, when you get to camp, when we get to camp, you're going to hear about Gardner Minshew also getting first team reps. I'm pretty sure in the preseason, when that comes and rolls around in August, both guys are going to get time with the starters. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an even battle where one guy isn't favored over the other guy. But I will say that if it's an even competition, so let's say by the end of the last preseason game, it's pretty even. I think Aiden O'Connell gets the lean simply because he's the younger player with presumably more upside. So my point is, if it's close and you really and and Gardner Minshew doesn't take hold of the job, so to speak, then I think you roll with Aiden O'Connell because you say if the guys are even, you go with the guy who has more upside. Who has more upside? Who's younger? Right now, if Gardner Minshew is even slightly better than Aiden O'Connell, you go with the best quarterback from the offseason. So again, while Aiden O'Connell is going to get first team reps, they're both going to get first team reps. And then you you just play the best quarterback of the competition, which is the logical approach to it. Yeah. And Aiden O'Connell, a, a lot of folks, again, <laughs> we have to be careful because a lot of people, why are you down on Aiden O'Connell? I And again, people hear what they want to hear. And that's not what we say. We we say, look, Aiden O'Connell did well. There, there's a difference between saying that Aiden O'Connell did well and he can develop into a good quarterback and, and thinking that Aiden O'Connell could be the franchise quarterback. I still don't believe that. That's not a negative. That's just my own opinion. I could be 100% wrong. He could come out and have a crazy MVP year. Who knows? We could see it. But um, obviously over his last five games last year, he was three and two. Uh, but a very up and down. So I think that's where they have to find it. And I know he's been working hard during the offseason. Pierce talked about that, too, in the quote I read, which is he's been in there a lot. He's been working hard, trying to do it. You have a lot of different terminology. All these things, it's tough for a rookie to do. Then you switch coaches. Now you're going to have a, a whole preseason and a new offense to learn. And so both guys got to learn it. But I do think you and I have had the same kind of mentality. Like, you're going to give a little bit of an edge in my book to Minshew, not because I think Minshew is some amazing quarterback, just because he's a veteran. He's got a couple skill sets that Aiden O'Connell doesn't have. Now, Aiden O'Connell has some attributes that Gardner Minshew doesn't have. But if I had to bet on it, I would say Minshew only because of that, that, that experience and his ability and what he's been able to do. But overall, I think it's going to be a fascinating, fascinating competition. And at the end of the day, uh, whoever wins out uh, is going to be the guy the Raiders are going to count on to get them to the next step after what they did last year. When you look at that situation and you look at what Aiden O'Connell had to work on, some of the mobility, some of the consistency, uh, to me, that's how he wins the job is he's got to come out and show that he can be consistent in the preseason, which he did last year. But um, it's going to be a gut call and, and, and they might not flip a coin over it or use a crazy eight ball, Mo. But... Um, I, it's going to be a tough decision. I think both players will play well, but that's what you want on a team. You want that level of competition. And we heard Pierce and Telesco talk about that last week. Yeah, I said it last week. I said it's going to be, I think it's going to be a close competition. I think mm -hmm. it's going to come down to the, you know, the final preseason game, final few practices. I don't think one player is going to blow the other out of the water when it comes to this competition. I don't consider Garner Minshew this, you know, Pro Bowl player, but I think he can offer a little more to the offense than Aiden O'Connell from a standpoint of improvisation, uh, off-platform throws, moving the, moving outside of the pocket. I think that's where he has the edge. If Aiden O'Connell is going to win this quarterback battle, he's going to have to show quick release, able to read coverages a lot better than he did last year. Again, that's a product of just, to me, inexperience. Now, we'll see how well he can get the ball out and read coverages this year, his second year. Now, he's going to be facing a familiar defense, his own defense. We'll see how he looks in the preseason maybe against, you know, guys who are going to be starters once the regular season comes up. But I look at Aiden O'Connell, I look at Gardner Minshew, and I say, you know, how high is the ceiling? Because remember, to mm. me, this Raiders season is going to hinge upon how well one of the one of those two guys play and how well Luke Getzey uses his offensive playmakers. Because in my opinion, 
you know, if the Raiders get just serviceable, serviceable quarterback play, they could be a wild card team. I'm not saying they win the AFC West, but I think they could be a wild card team that can win, that can eke out nine or 10 games if the quarterback play is high enough. Now, if the quarterback play is just middling or those two guys look like low end starters, high end backups, then you're looking at a, probably a seven to eight win season. So well, we're going to get into that schedule stuff in your prediction because you have your Bleacher Report live coming up on Wednesday. So don't miss that. If you don't already have the Bleacher Report app, by the way, go get it so you can and we'll give you the details at the end of the show. But make sure you get it so you can watch Mo and then he'll talk about it on our Thursday show. What he talked about on the Wednesday live with Bleacher Report. And I'll give my prediction, too, on the wins and losses. But Mo, you bring up a good point because I think that and again, this is not a wet towel, right? Throwing on the wet towel of Raider Nation here. But. The Raiders will have those weapons, and we've said it now consistently for about, I think, three shows in a row that the pressure on Luke Getze is going to be much greater because he has those tools and not a lot of an excuse. But I will say this, and I will argue this till the cows come home, which is, is quarterbacks make receivers better, not the other way around. Okay? So the Raiders have those weapons. They have Bowers. They have a mayor. They have Devontae. They have Jacoby Myers. They have Trey Tucker. They have these great weapons there on offense. But like you said, if if you get a, a a very average performance to below average performance from quarterback, that's going to stunt their ability to win ball games. If if they get if they get Aiden O'Connell to be consistent at the level he was when he performed well last year, or if Gardner Minshew performs at his higher level where he where he can go, then you're looking at a team I think that that can compete maybe for a playoff opportunity. But that's why some of us, and I know a lot of you, oh, who cares about the quarterback? Maybe we already have our quarterbacks. And that's why the quarterback is so important because you can have the best wide receivers, the best tight ends, the best running backs, everybody. And if you don't get consistent, you know, very good quarterback play, and I'm not saying best in the league kind of MVP play, but to your point, above average, then uh, it's going to be hard for you to win and go far. It doesn't mean you can't make the playoffs, right? You can be a fringe team, I think, with a quarterback that's above average. But to kind of take you to that next level, it's very difficult. Scott, just really quick. Mm -hmm. The quarterbacks of the playoff teams last year. Now, there's in the AFC, to me, there's one exception where you're like, eh, not great quarterback play, but they still win the playoffs. Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen. Miami Dolphins, say what you want about Tua. Tua is pretty good with Tyreek Hill there, right? Mm -hmm. Baltimore, Lamar Jackson. You can make the argument Cleveland as well. Deshaun yeah. Watson hasn't been playing well. But Joe Flacco came in, and he was lighting it up. Joe Flacco came in and he was throwing for 300 plus yards in yeah. that offense. Let's not forget. Uh, you look at Pittsburgh, who I just mentioned, they had Kenny Pickett and then they had Mason Rudolph. You know, great defense, well coached team. They made the playoffs as a seven seed. So they barely made the cut. Houston, CJ Stroud, extraordinary rookie year at quarterback. Kansas City, we all know Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> so looking at those quarterbacks, even in the NFC, Dak Prescott with Dallas, Jalen Hurts with Philly, even though he had a down year, he was still a pro bowler. Detroit, Jared Goff, Green Bay Packers. How did Jordan Love look at the end of last year? Uh, Tampa Bay, Baker Mayfield, the guy I wanted the Raiders to sign last year, signs an extension with Tampa Bay. Pretty good now. San Francisco, Brock Purdy with Kyle Shanahan, Matthew Stafford. So I just read out there are two, maybe two exceptions of teams that didn't have, you know, quality quarterback play with consistency in Cleveland and Pittsburgh. In the ASC. And let's remember with Joe Burrow being healthy in Cincinnati this year, assuming he stays healthy, yeah. one of those teams probably don't make the playoffs if Joe Burrow stays healthy. Aaron Rodgers also coming back with the Jets. If the Jets are consistent and Aaron Rodgers is healthy, one of those teams probably don't make the playoffs. So assuming these guys are healthy, you're going to need a quarterback who's going to have to give you a little bit of above average play if you're going to make the playoffs in the AFC or the NFC. Yes, exactly. And again, uh, yes, your point about Joe Flacco got hot at the end of the year. Absolutely. Pittsburgh, I think, is the one big outlier, right? Because they didn't mm -hmm. really have good, consistent quarterback play. But look right. what happened to him when they got in the playoffs, right? But, but like um, I said, Scott, really quick, if Joe Burrow stays healthy, Pittsburgh probably doesn't make the playoffs. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. So, so that's where it's at. And that's why we talk about quarterback. Look, the Raiders, they, they, they don't need to deal with that decision now because they have two guys there. They have four in camp. And so they're going to come out of, out of camp with three quarterbacks and those are going to be the guys for the year. We'll see who wins it out, but it's going to be interesting. And I just, I don't put too much stock. And I think Antonio Pierce is doing the right thing with a young quarterback by building his confidence and saying, Hey, 
He's the guy. He was here for us. I went to him. I trusted him and he did his best. And so now he's got to take it up the next step. I also like, by the way, Mo, as an aside, you know, Minshew has a very wild and, and I think different person, quirky personality, which fits in well with the Raiders. We talked about that. I also think it's good for Aiden O'Connell because he is not that way. Aiden O'Connell is a quiet type leader, very religious guy. And so I think having the kind of duality of that and having a guy, whether he's behind him or he's starting in front of him, having Gardner Minshew in that room and kind of keeping it loose and keeping it different is going to be, I think, a really big net positive for Aiden O'Connell too. Yeah, you get to see the, like you said, the duality, the personalities. It also creates a dynamic where the coaches could kind of see who the players respond to a lot mm. better. Do they respond to Gardner Minshew's leadership with his quirky personality, or do they respond more to Aiden O'Connell's more quiet leadership? Now, remember, Aiden O'Connell, also less experienced, so he may not be as vocal going into his second year as a Gardner Minshew who's been around the league for you know more than a handful of years. So that's another reason why I give Gardner Minshew the edge, simply because mm. he has more experience being in a leadership role. Let's remember the quarterback position isn't just a quarterback, isn't just a quarterback position. We just throw around the football. You also have to be a leader and a coach on the football field. And that's where Gardner Minshew has an edge right away. Absolutely. It'll be fascinating to watch. I'm excited about it. I think both players, they're going to do well. So I think the Raiders going into the regular season uh, where you have to really prove it out, by the way. But I think going into the regular season, we'll see two quarterbacks who perform well in the preseason that you guys can feel good about. But it all comes when the rubber hits the road. And as Antonio Pierce says, uh, resume on the grass. So we'll see how they're able to do (laughs) when it comes up. All right, we're going to take our final break here. When we come back here on the Tuesday edition of Silver and Black today, guess what? We're getting to your phone calls. Yeah, we're we're doing it twice a week now because we're getting so many good calls. Uh, And yes, it's not going to be an hour and a half show like last time where we had to catch up with a ton of calls. We're going to have some calls here and then uh, also invite you to call in for Thursday's show. And actually, as we were recording this, uh, two calls came in. So your calls will be on Thursday. So just so if you called in uh, during during the recording, that's when it's going to be on. But anyway, we'll do that when we come back here on Odyssey Sports and Silver and Black today. You're with Scott. You're with Mo. We're coming right back after these words. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back here to Silver and Black today, the home stretch here. Segment number three, the Raider Nation mailbag for Tuesday. Yes, we added another one because we're getting so many calls from you guys, but we want to do that. You're with Scott Branson and Mo Moten. If you're joining us now, Mo Moten is the senior NFL writer over Bleach Report. Also, Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com, at Mo, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N, on x.com. I am at LV Gully. The show is SNB today. Get online with us. And do that. By the way, I was mowing my lawn this weekend, Mo, and I have this big part of my property next to a pond, and I <laughs> and I have a bench under a tree, and I kind of kind of call it my thinking space. So like I can get away from the house, I can go out there. It was a beautiful day. It was like 70 degrees before it gets too hot. And I was just pondering like social media, because we we give our handles out, we talk to people all the time. And I even texted you about it later because Man, I was like, man, I don't know how much good a society this is for. And it's so funny because even though I was doing it on a social platform, it's just a you know stream of consciousness. <laughs> Some of the responses were so funny. Like, oh, you're using social media to say that social media is bad and all that stuff. But we love interacting with you guys. So uh, I appreciate it. I mean, 98% of people who respond and interact are great. And we appreciate the conversation. So we'll do that. And we love their calls. So. That's where it goes. It can, like anything in the world, you can use things for positive or you can use things for negative. We try to stay positive. Good or evil. Evil. Yeah, you Devil choose. Or <laughs> angel on your shoulder. Either way, you're going to see it out there. All right, we're going to get right to the calls. Our first call comes from our good buddy, Pastor Mike, in his prison ministry, doing a lot of God's work out there and doing so with those that are incarcerated. Very important to do. And we appreciate that. So let's go to Pastor Mike now out in California. Here he is. Yo, Scott, Mo. It's Pastor Mike behind bars. Hope everything's going well today. Um, I am. I wanted to call in and just kind of talk about uh, this whole Josh Jacobs thing. I know you guys kind of touched on it already, but just want to put my two cents in. And um, as a fan, it's like, you know, hey, I'm thinking, great. You know, he, he goes to the Packers. I guess my issue with him is is that when the whole AP thing happened, when he finally got hired, he's like, he was happy. He was excited, you know, that he was going to be a Raider. 
all this other stuff, and then um, and then he goes to the Packers. I don't have a problem with that. It's all business. I get all that too. The thing is, is that I believe I, I don't know if we really know the terms of his contract, but from what I heard, and maybe I'm wrong, is that really he only has a one year deal for twelve million bucks, and then he has two team options. And to me, I'm like, I thought his whole deal was to, um, you know, is to, you know, is to have, you know, more, more time, you know, have multi-year. It wasn't exactly the money. So, so my attitude though is I, I'm not going to cry because he didn't say goodbye. I don't really care about that. <laughs> um, but it, it's just, it's ridiculous that, you know, he, uh, was like, yeah, I want to be a Raider. I want to be a Raider. And now all of a sudden he's a Packer and he's, you know, and he's doing all this stuff on Twitter, which he's always been doing. So, not a big deal, but you know, hey, good luck to him. Unless we play him, like you said, and we'll kick his ass, that's fine. Um, actually, I'm like, I'm hoping maybe he doesn't do that well. You know, I, <laughs> I'm vindictive that way. I guess I, I need to repent. Yes. Um, also, wanted to talk about you know the whole, uh, the whole thing about flipping the coin, and and people, <laughs> it amazes me that people actually believe that, and I, maybe they don't, but. They actually believe that we flipped a coin to choose between Brock <laughs> Bowers and, and Arnold. I'm like, come on, man. You know, it, it's called a figure of speech, right? I mean, so it's really like, yeah, we we're going to pick you, but then Brock Bowers fell to us, so we took him. So we flipped the coin, right? But anyway, I hope you guys have a great week. Um, enjoy your show. Enjoy calling in, and we'll talk to you next time. All right, there you go, Pastor Mike. <laughs> There Pastor Mike, as always, a great call. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's start backwards here. Uh, we'll start with the coin flip thing, which, as you predicted, has pretty much died off. Although some some sites are kind of trying to keep it going, and they even asked Pierce about it again last week, and he's kind of didn't answer it. And oh, so he didn't answer, so it must be true. No, it's just ridiculous. So he's not answering it. But that was that was number one. So Pastor Mike, absolutely. And Mo hit it. I don't even have to repeat what you said, Mo, because it was like, psh, that was it. Uh, on the situation with Josh Jacobs, he brings up a good point there about the years. And I think I think for some fans, and I heard a from a couple of them after our last show where we discussed it, saying, yeah, you know, he said he wanted to be a Raider and that, well, you know, he got this deal. Now, he did get a little more money from what we've heard that the Raiders were going to pay him for the one year uh, on the two-year deal. But at the same time, Mo... Things change for people, and sometimes, you know, he he said he loved Antonio Pierce and all that, but a couple of things happened. You got a new GM, and the GM is actually the guy who makes those moves, number one. And number two, maybe Josh Jacobs thought, you know what? It might be good for me to go somewhere else after all the crap I've been through here, because he has been through a lot. Um, and sometimes you want to challenge yourself and just do something different. And so that might have, that's nothing against Raider Nation. It's just as an individual, you sometimes want a different challenge. I find it hard to comment on contractual decisions because we don't know what the Raiders offer Josh Jacobs. We don't. Only only so, what was reported. Only what was reported. So we don't exactly know what offers were on the table for him. Now, Pastor Mike, you're right. His con Josh Jacobs basically has a one year deal where the Packers can exercise options in his contract for the following two years. So. I mean, he's not secure past 2020, the 2024 season. Right. But if the Raiders were offering considerably less, he's, he may be he may have been thinking, okay, the team has the option to let me go, but then I can go back on the market and then get the, the secure contract versus staying with the Raiders for less money. Maybe he just chose more money in 2024 and, and felt like that was the best decision for him. Mm -hmm. Now, again, last offseason, the discussion was he wanted more years. He wanted the <clears throat> multi-year security. And perhaps the Rays were willing to offer that at a much lower salary. He said, again, I'll play for the Packers. If I play well, they'll exercise that option and I'll get another year. If I don't play well, if I get hurt or something happens, I go back to the market. And maybe I get a multi-year deal from another team. Who knows? But Josh Jacobs isn't some old running back, so he can still hit go back into the market and still get a pretty decent deal yeah. if if something were to happen and the Packers want to move on. Because the Packers did draft Marshawn Lloyd, and they did re-sign A.J. Dillon, so they have a platoon of running backs there. But because they have that platoon of running backs, he's less likely to get hurt. Because remember, that was the issue when he was with the Raiders, that he was, he was a workhorse back, 
and he would get nicked up where he wouldn't miss too many games, but he would miss a game here or there, some plays here or there. Now in Green Bay, he's going to be preserved because he's going to be sharing the rock with two other ball carriers. So it's more of a chance that he's going to stay healthy and be able to be efficient. So it comes down to his decision what he wants. I'm not going to judge him for it. No, I don't. I don't either. I mean, listen, and and, and I I mean it's true too. I'm not. I wasn't putting down the Raiders, but look at what Josh Jacobs went through with the Gruden stuff, all that stuff, and last year, and and Josh yeah. McDaniels, and all that. So you know, sometimes guys, they really do. It's not that they, I, I, again, that that they don't love the opportunity they had with the Raiders, but it's just an opportunity to go somewhere else, and 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 maybe maybe that that shakes things up for you and does something different for you and, and being with the Packers gives him maybe a different type of audience and people see him more who knows, but uh, pastor Mike, we appreciate the call. All right. We're going right on to Raider Izzy, who I believe is out in California. Raider Izzy. Here he is. What up guys. It's Raider Izzy. Um, just got a quick question for you. Um, after June 1st, I know we're coming into a, a good amount of money. It's like 24.08 million in the, uh, it's obviously going to be added to our salary cap. Um, and, and it, when you watch, when you watch these shows, and listen to these podcasts, like the, the common thing that everyone is saying is that this money can be utilized to re-sign your own, which obviously I'm all in for. Like I know we have Hobbs coming up. Love Nate Hobbs. His contract's coming up. Spillane's contract's coming up. Coons' contract's coming up. Diablo, I don't really know if we're there yet, but uh, it's same deal there. Like, we have guys that we have to resign. I get it. The question is, um, with these contracts, especially Hobbs and, and Coons, um, Spillane might be different. I'm not too sure just because that was a free agent signing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but those would be extensions, not new contracts. So wouldn't the money technically need to be there next year? Like, I don't think that their salary would actually increase this season. Thus, the salary cap that we'd get after June 1st, I don't feel like we'd be able to use for those extensions. Like, and, and am I saying that right? Like, Gary, you guys understand what I'm saying? Like, for instance, Hobbs, let's say I don't have it in front of me. Let's say he's making 500K this year, okay? Once he signs that extension, his 2024 number is not going to be increased. That money is going to be pushed to to next year because it's, it's a contract extension, not a, not a new contract. So I guess in theory, maybe you could change it this year to get some of that money out. And even signing bonuses are spread out over the course of like the duration of the contract of so the a four year contract, the signing bonus is going to be split into four different pieces. So mm. I, I guess I'm, I'm not understanding how the money this year, this 24 mil that we're going to get after June 1st is going to be able to necessarily help with these extensions because the money would in my head be the following years. Yeah. So I hope that makes sense. If not, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, you can answer <laughs> that. I'd appreciate it. Thanks fellas. Love the show. Later. All right. Good call Raider. Izzy. Yes. It can get confusing. So we will try to walk you through this if we understood you correctly. And I think you did a pretty good job. So I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to start with one, which is this idea of, Hey, so, and he's using Nate Hobbs as an ex like, for example, extension. Yes. If you extend a contract since he's a young player in his rookie contract, um, two things there. One is yes. The money against the salary cap would come later based on how much they're paying him per year including roster bonuses and all that stuff. But remember the 24 million after June one, which could be higher by the way, depending on what the Raiders do too, with, um, with um, also some, some, some restructures, which we'll talk about is that most of these players Mo and the way the teams make good and, and, and incentivize these deals where it doesn't impact the, the salary cap so much is they will give them a bonus up front, which does not count towards the salary cap. So if you're Nate Hobbs, like you, I'll use his example, 500,000. And let's say they give you a raise to 750 or a million per year. But what they're going to do is they're going to give you a 12 million signing bonus up front. So you get that big influx of cash now so they can keep your salary at a level that fits into their cap number over time. That's one example, Mo. What else sticks out for you about uh, Izzy's question? No, it's a good example because it, it differentiates between cap space and cash flow. And I think that's the confusing part, even for the season NFL writers that there's cash and there's cap space and you want to have cash available to again, pay players up front. 
And then the cap space is what you see on sites like Spot Rack and Over the Cap. And that's the number mm-hmm. that a lot of us deal with when we're writing and talk about, talking about these football teams. But, Brady, is it to your point about having money years down the line is correct? So let's say the Raiders extend. I think of the players that you mentioned, Raider Izzy, I think Michael Kuntz is most likely to get an extension because I think with the edge rusher position, you want to pay players before they blow up because then the price only goes up, right? Right. So let's. I'll use Malcolm Kuntz as, a, as an example. I don't know. Whatever the number that Malcolm Kuntz is making right now, if the Raiders sign him to an extension, his 2024 cap number stays the same. He may sign, like you said, a signing bonus and get cash right away, but his cap number for 2024 will stay the same, and it will increase after 2024. So he's right. Ready, Izzy, what I will say is that when you talk about June 1 cap space coming in, I think that's more for if the Raiders want to make a trade post-June 1 because there are a lot of guys who may not be designated for post-June 1 cuts and teams will just wait till June 2nd to trade those guys. That's when you make those second wave of moves with that cap space that you get after June 1. Trades and late free agent signings. So guys like Stephon Gilmore is still available. Dory Jackson is still available. Zayvon Howard is still available. My guy Steven Nelson is still available. The Raiders may use that influx of cap space after June 1 to sign one of those guys at cornerback. And don't forget, too, and you made the point earlier when we were talking some some of the young players, Mo, about making the roster. Each NFL team can designate two post-June June 1st cuts Okay, so this is somebody, let's say, let's say they had hung on to Hunter Renfro and they cut him after June 1st. The advantage is to cutting and the reason they limited to two, but you get two is because then when you cut a player post June 1st, you can actually split up that cap number. So if you were to, if you were to, if you were to cut somebody, you're able to split up that cap number. You don't take the hit right away. Uh, That's why they only allow you to do it to two players, uh, which of course we know the Raiders will do this year. Right. To, and to, to Raider Izzy's point, though, again, you are correct in saying mm-hmm. the cap number doesn't move for the current year, even if they si- if they sign an extension, because it's not a new contract. You hear the term new money. So when a quarterback signs an extension, they play out the rookie scale of their, of their contract years. And then what they call new money, which is the extension money, kicks in, you know, years or a year or two down the line. So. That's that's correct, Brady Izzy. But like I said, when you talk about an influx of cap space after June one, those moves are usually for signings and or trades. Yeah, new and, contracts. And, it, and to your point about the quarterback contract, big bonus up front because that doesn't count against the cap. That's why teams right. will do that. The cash flow point cash that flow. you made. The other thing is those restructures. That's how they also free up money from a cap perspective. Because what they do, let's say Devonte Adams, who's going to kill the Raiders next year with a cap hit, right? What they can do is they can say, hey, okay, Devontae, we're going to convert that. We're going to move it and give you a a $30 million bonus right now so that next year and the year after and the year after, your cap hit number will come down significantly because they convert it by restructuring the contract. So the restructures are really big and have been used effectively by a lot of teams that have been successful over the years, including the Bills, including the Chiefs, including the Ravens, to move that around so that they can stay competitive. So I would imagine that we'll see that too. Great call though, Izzy. Appreciate it very much. As always. All right. Our last call of the day, and I already listened to this one, and it gets cut off at the end because he went to three minutes, but I want to play it. Uh, and I don't know if this is his online name or if it's his real name, but his name is Aiden O'Brady. He didn't tell me where he was calling from. I know who this is. You do know who this is? Okay, cool. So here is Aiden with his call. Yeah. Hey, guys. My name is Aiden O'Brady. Um, I just wanted to call out and reach uh, reach out to you guys. Uh, longtime listener, first-time caller. I just had a couple comments and a question um the comments that i would make is right like you know their car kind of struggled uh back half of the season uh year before last in uh, mcdaniel's offense you know there were some struggles there that led to his ultimate benching and us moving on for quarterbacks and not trying to get into the controversy of that just kind of stating facts um then, you know, we go into the next season, same offense, you know, Bo Hardegree as uh, quarterback coach, um, because, again, McDaniels, you know, running the show and, you know, say what you want about Jimmy G. Uh, he obviously um, had, you know, his worst season that he's ever had. This is a guy that, you know, actually, you know, helped take a team to a Super Bowl. 
Um, and so, you know, regardless of what we all feel about him as a quarterback after seeing him play for the Raiders, the facts are that um, he did, you know, dramatically worse than he had prior to that. And some of that could have been injury related. Um, the other thing that I would bring up, um, obviously, Brian Hoyer was a, you know, a struggle uh, when he when he got in there. And then you've got the fourth round rookie, right? So third string reps, um, head coach is fired. Um, interim, uh, Antonio Pierce comes into the position. He, an NFL offense with its vernacular and um, everything that they do to install that is not something that we can just, you know, change in between weeks. You know, on Tuesday and Wednesday, we're going to install a whole new offense. It, it doesn't work like that. We, we were running Josh McDaniel's system the entire season with some tweaks, but the rookie offensive coordinator that really didn't have uh, a giant resume when it came to being a quarterback coach, much less, you know, play calls and, and figuring out what, what teams are doing against us. I, I think every quarterback that's played in that system then in that one and a half years that McDaniels was running it had their struggles, um, except for a rookie that, you know, seemed to me anyway, the last part of the season really kind of started to find himself. I mean, Pierce was, you know, playing it conservative, leaning on his defense, calling a lot of screen calls, trying to establish the run and being conservative with uh, play calling as far as passing is concerned uh, through, um, you know, the conduit of Bo Hardigree. And, you know, I, I just think that there were several things that needed to be fixed um, on the offensive line. There you go. Aiden got cut off because there's a three minute limit on the voicemail. So, but Aiden, uh, good question. Mo, I'm going to let you go ahead and answer this one. And I'll make a point uh, when you're done. So it looks like from the from the call, Aiden O'Brady, as your Twitter handle is, <laughs> uh, you're, you're making the case that Aiden O'Connell, I don't want to say was held back, but he went through a tough circumstance with the Raiders based on the transition uh, having a Josh McDaniels offense that didn't really work out for the quarterbacks that he had on the roster and that there is some upside to Aiden O'Connell and he should do a lot better simply because now you're you're out you're away from the Josh McDaniel system you're assuming that you brought in an offensive coordinator who can accentuate Aiden O'Connell's strengths because he does have them mm -hmm. and the offense should look a lot better than it did last year what I will say is that one, Aiden O'Connell does have to show at least that he's also made some improvements because that's let's be honest, every rookie's no rookie's perfect, right? Even CJ Stroud has things to work on. Um, but I, I also think that with Aiden O'Connell, he could do a lot better in Luke Getty's offense, but there's also a competition. So let's say Aiden O'Connell shows progression and he looks a lot better, he looks you know light years better than he did in Josh McDaniel's offense. But what if Gardner Mitchell also looks pretty good? So, again, I'm not putting down Aiden O'Connell. I'm not saying Aiden no. O'Connell can't look a lot better in this offense than he did last year. But it, it is a competition, and it's not just Aiden O'Connell competing against himself. And this is why I say it's gonna, I think it's going to be a close competition. But you have to understand, too, that with Luke Getzey, I know you criticized Josh McDaniel's offense. Luke Getzey's offense wasn't lining it up in Chicago. <laughs> I understand he was a pass game coordinator with the Green Bay Packers, but as I explained last week, he wasn't making all the passing game play calls in all situations. In third right. down situations, it was the offensive line coach. In goal line situations, it was another coach. So if you're if you're putting down Josh McDaniel's offense, let's remember that Luke, while some of the blame goes to quarterback Justin Fields, Luke Gessie's offense wasn't high powered in Chicago. So we'll see what Aiden O'Connell and Garno Minshew look like in this offense is still TBD to be determined. And remember, too, the one point I want to make, too, because I, I talked about earlier that that if you look at Aiden O'Connell as a starter, the last five games he was three and two. But I want you to understand that in two of those games, he had a passer rating against Minnesota, remember the three to nothing loss of 66 against the Chiefs, the big win on Christmas that everybody loves. He had a 50 passer rating. I mean, 50, it's bad, okay? We know he didn't complete. He was 9 of 21. 
96. And then of course against Denver, he has 110. So if you look at the stats, he's, you know, one game, he's a 60 uh, rated quarterback. The next game, he's 110. Next game, he's 50. Next game, he's 116. It's like, so that's the consistency I talked about. It's there. Right. And remember his completion percentage was actually very high Mo, because they took the offense and they, they allowed him to throw the ball short outs and do all these different things to make sure that they built the confidence. So I think Antonio Pierce and at the time, uh, Bo Hart agreed, they understood they had a rookie quarterback. They weren't asking him to do too much, but even when they weren't asking him to do too much, he struggled, but he's a rookie. So you understand that. So, so Aiden, I understand your, your, your point of view there. And I think that, yes, now it'll be, that's why Mo and I have said, there's a lot of pressure on the Getsy. Let's see how these guys do. And hopefully both of them do better, much better than they did last year in a different system. And hopefully Luke Getsy does what he needs to do to uh, make the most out of the guys he has. Now, Mo, before we go, because we're here at the end of the show, I want you to tell people we just got word right on Monday that the NFL schedule release will be 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Tell everybody about your Bleacher Report Live. So on Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific time, I will have a Bleacher Report live immediately after the official schedule release drops. I'll be going through each Raider game, giving my win-loss prediction as I did last year. Again, I had every Josh McDaniels game predicted correctly last year. So uh, we'll see how I do this year, but I'll give my best early prediction projection of what the Raiders will be win-loss-wise in the 2024 season. Now, people, I just want to say, I'm not saying they, these predictions are going to be perfect. These are just my early predictions. The before injuries camp happen. predictions. Right. Injuries happen. The Raiders are probably going to add a cornerback. I still feel like they're going to add a veteran cornerback, so that can move the needle with some of my predictions. But I'm basing these predictions based on what the roster looks like right now. So if I talk about a team being able to exploit the Raiders' weakness at cornerback, I'm talking about it. it for Wednesday. Though I expect them to sign a veteran cornerback, they have not. I can't assume that they will. So I'm basing it on the roster right now as it is Wednesday. Yes, absolutely. So uh, make sure you tune in to Bleacher Report live for that. And then um, we'll have a show on Thursday. We might even go live Thursday morning, uh, which I know most of our people watch at night. So I'm just warning everybody now we we'll, might be on Thursday morning if Mo and I are up in time to 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 be presentable after the scheduling stuff and writing and all that kind of stuff but so look for that we'll we'll keep you updated on that make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio also on youtube hit subscribe and the notifications bell make sure you follow mo m-o-e-m-o-t-o-n and i am at lv gully on x.com and the show is smb today mo take care my friend i'll talk to you on thursday we'll talk schedule talk thursday all right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Momo, and I'm Scott Colbrands, and this has been Silver and Black Today. Take care, everybody. Have a great week, and we'll see you on Thursday.